Thank you. And uh, I'm very glad to be here back to, in Hebrew University because I've been thinking about this problem 15 years ago when I was at uh, Hebrew University for another conference. I think uh, Haim was organizing it, Cortical Dynamics in Jerusalem, yeah? And uh, so that was 15 years ago. And now 15 years passed. And uh, so this may be a little uh, kind of a perspective. And uh, also, um, some of you might know that 15 years ago, or 20 years ago, I started um, Vision when I was doing efficient coding. So I was having this intellectual crisis of efficient coding is not quite right, especially when it's in V1. So uh, I'll just give you my perspective. So uh, yesterday from Yayevai's talk, you already see that efficient coding has a little, um, uh, is this the one? Yeah. So we have this Infomax and this thing's uh, um, Barlow. And the, the, the idea is if we understand V1, or if I understand retina, then you can go on, maybe understand V1, you know, even more redundancy reduced, and understand V2, more redundancy reduced, all, all the way, then you get, you know, your object. And that was the hope. But then when you go to V1, you find it's, it's not quite right. Maybe in V1, the extra thing that's haven't been, been done in a retina is sterile, because you have time, space, color, all done already in retina and, and LGN. The still is the only thing afterwards. And you find that even when you change from center to the field to, to orientation selectivity, you don't really get much more redundancy reduction. And that's even with uh, one complete, uh, you know. Yesterday, Yaya was talking about undercomplete. So why is it overcomplete? You have one million cells in V1 uh, ganglion cell, you have 100 million. So there's a 100 times expansion if you want redundancy reduction. This is redundancy expansion. And uh, so what is the other 99% of V1 doing? So, so, and this is a little bit uh, kind of in contrast to the last talk where people try to understand V1 from stimulus to cell response. And that's uh, one way of understanding V1. A lot of physiologists, uh, yeah, a bit higher, okay. And another way of understanding V1 is from V1 to behavior. So it's the functional role rather than uh, if you uh, understand, I think uh, Carandini had a workshop uh, a few years ago in, in cipher neuroscience where they concluded that you can only uh, predict like 15% of V1's uh, variability, even though, um, you know, Hubert Weasel has got all these V1 data. Long time ago, you still cannot understand V1's uh, cell. Mike is not working? Okay, maybe it's hiding behind. Okay, i put it here. Okay, so, and, uh, so some ideas. So V1 detect edges, Th those are the uh, feature, detector, uh, feature detector model, right? Uh, it's been around for a while. But uh, uh, they really only detect edges, isolated edges. And also, it doesn't really answer in order to do what, yeah? And uh, it prepares something for more important stuff. That means this something is not as important as the real stuff later. It doesn't really recognize objects. Or and it may be a drawing board for feedbacks, and there's a, a hey, you know, uh, as if it's just a back office role. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but then uh, this is the, the graph shown. I actually copied this from uh, Motion. Uh, this is the Van Essen diagram, a proportional, a redrawn proportional to the sizes of the actual visual area. And V1 is huge, yeah? And let's just put it in perspective. You know, MT is very tiny there. Look at this more anatomical one. Uh, you know, frontal eye field, very tiny. LIP, we know, very, very tiny. And V4, a lot of our favorite, uh, small. And, uh, and the brain is expensive. You know, we use a lot of our brain, uh, uh, blood. So we seem to know much more about these small, tiny areas of brain, what they're doing, you know, they, they move our hand, they move our eye. But V1, the, the huge, expensive one, um, we seem not to know what to do. So V1 is looking for a job. So let's find a job for it. So this, the job we're trying to find is this. Another question, which is uh, in another community of uh, brain science, psychology and behavior. Uh, you know, in computational terms, we have visual input encoded and decoded afterwards. Of course, it's not exactly reproduced the original one, but uh, there's a huge gap in between. 
And we actually do not decode everything. In fact, we decode almost nothing. Okay. Uh, we only decode like 1% of the input. So this is shown in change blindness. We're blind to almost everything. So uh, you look at this picture A. I'm going to show you picture B. And uh, tell me uh, what has changed, right? So this is picture A, picture B. What has changed? Color? This color? I, I, it's that. Oh, really? <laughs> Even I'm blind to that change. It's not changed. Okay. So now, let, let me turn on your V1, and then you'll see what's changed. I, I, I did not turn on your V1. Now I turned on your V1. What's changed? Yeah? The mountain. That's right. So if you go quickly, your V1 turned on, you can't see it. So most of the time... Can you see it again? Okay. Okay. Yeah, so V1, uh, yeah, basically, we do not decode. We do not, how much we do not decode? Okay, the visual input comes in many megabytes per second, where digital image is one megabyte per image, right? Of course, there's redundancy you can think about. Uh, but even redundancy, our JPEG uh, compression is probably compressed 100 times. But this is 40 bits per second. This is megabytes per second. So this is really, really you know, tiny fraction, we are blind to almost everything. And therefore, we do not decode. We have to funnel this through uh, the attentional bottleneck, then decode. So in perspective, the attentional bottleneck is more important to decide what to decode and what not to decode. So the, so the task is to delete most of the things and select the irrelevant. This is, is select the relevant. Okay, but, but, yeah. but you can maybe attend to arbitrary selection of these that, That's true. So this attention. You can say this attention, if I attend to the sky, you know, that I'll be eaten by the tiger. So therefore, where, where to attend uh, is more important than to decode, so that, because that's critical. But I have to, you know, when a tiger jumps, I've got to attend to the tiger and run away. So, <laughs> yeah. And so the second motivation question, is this such an important task? Which brain area does that? So the job opening, yeah. So let's do the matchmaking. The viewer wants a job. Has a job opening, very important job, needs a huge brain area. It's such an important task. Yeah, otherwise, we all die without seeing the tiger. And so let's give it to V1. And um, so, uh, so that visual attention mostly is a little bit like a we, we, we know what we attend to, we, we, we intentionally attend to. So we have a, a, a cognitive bias to study top down attention because that's what we know. You know. I'm looking to lecture because I'm listening to lecture, I'm attending. Attention usually is by your eye staring at it, focusing on it. And so mo most works on attention looks top down, looks at a top down attention. But behaviorally, you know bottom up attention is more important because just by a layman experiment, most people think they move their eyes only five times a second, but you in fact move your eyes almost 200 times a second. So most of the eye movements you don't know. Therefore, bottom up attention is more involuntary attention. It's behaviorally much more important. This is showing behavior data. Therefore, if you want to know how you attend, Bottom up attention is the big ballpark, uh, even though we are biased, not, know, not aware of it, where it's like our unknown unknowns, we're less likely to know it, we should, we should actually act a bit more dumber. This is like what Larry says, you know, we're too smart to understand the brain, we should be a bit dumber, we just think like dumb V1, then we may understand the brain a bit better. So the focus of this talk is going to be bottom up attention, even though uh, most of visual area, of visual behavior is both top down and bottom up. If we can kind of disable the top down um, by some idealization, experiment design, where uh, behavior can be more or less bottom up, then we understand it. So the outline talk is going to be uh, introduction of this, what is bottom up selection, and we're going to have a quiz. Let's see, uh, testing the ones. Uh, and the theory, what is the theory behind it, the theory, and then how to, how to test the theory. So. Even if you're looking for flamingos, you'll see the hippo, you know, it's just automatic. I don't have to tell you to look at it. I don't have to tell you to look at it, you automatically see the red dot. Or automatically see the vertical bar, and the, you know, automatically see the face, and so on. And so all of these show you that whatever that automatically attracts your attention, your gaze go to it, are the distinctive things. Very, very distinctive. You know, they're just so obviously different from others. Okay. So here's the quiz. What visual feature is not distinctive, but grabs your eye. 
And for those who already heard from me, you are not allowed to answer. <laughs> okay. Any guess? What is the V? The hint is I'm thinking about V1. Okay. What is V1 and what is non distinctive grabs your eye? So, what is about V1? And by the way, V1 is probably the most, you know, the brain structure we have most data on. So, we know a lot of V1, which is actually the gold mine for series. The more data you have, the better for series. So, we can, you know, dig gold mines in it. And if you cannot answer that question, don't worry because it took me 10 years to. <laughs> It took me 10 years to answer that question myself. So basically, you have, let's say you have picture lots of bars. Nothing is distinctive. But one of, bars, one of those bars, for wh whatever reason, grabs your attention. Something is special about this bar, but it's invisible to you. What is that feature? It's not color. It's not orientation. It's not motion. What is it? It's visual feature, not like it has a sound auditory feature. What is that feature that's about V1? It's not because you have nothing else to see. Even when you have something else pops out, you still look at that non-distinctive bar. It's more popping out than this pop-out feature. Okay. So the answer took me 10 years to get out to it is uh, uh, eye of origin. V1, everybody knows ocular dominance, right? V1 is tuned to eyes, and V2 is not. Anything else is not uh, uh, in the brain. So you have this bar that's distinctive because it's seen in the left eye and other bars seen in the right eye. And in your perception, you fuse them up and you see this whole picture. You think your bo both of your eyes see in this whole picture. And it doesn't look distinctive, to, but your eye goes to it. Yeah? What is it, the question? Why, uh, explain, uh, say it again. Is why it is... Uh, Okay, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's indeed, I'll explain, that's the part of the talk. So, uh, another thing, this is in the context of background. In 1988, people have shown that humans have no ability to distinguish this situation from that situation. The two things uh, uh, differ only that this bar is moved back into the original eye. Okay, and so people cannot tell them apart. So you have no awareness of it, and the reason people cannot is because only V1 has monocular cells starting from V2, you don't have monocular cells. So this information is completely gone. Behaviorally, we don't see it. Physiologically, uh, you, uh, you, you don't know. Uh, uh, Can yeah? I just say, people, we can't see it because you're not showing it to us in each eye. That's right. So don't, don't worry if you can't see it. You don't know, that's, that's right. right. That's right. right. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, some question here? Yeah, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't projected to this bar. OK. <laughs> if you can free fuse, you'll be easier. Yeah. Yeah, so basically you just have to uh, take this data. Jeremy Wolf is a, 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 a vision attention scientist who, who does a lot of visual pop bar, visual search. So he said, let's do a visual search for a bar, a target defined by, you know, visual search is a, a target defined by unique color, unique orientation. So, 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 so the search is to show these two things to show two eyes. Yeah, two eyes. See this, that's the, the, that yeah, they, they perceive this, but this is actually shown to them. You can use goggles to do it, yeah, in your 3D movies, it's IMAX theater, whatever. And they perceive this, and Jeremy Wolf say, okay, the target is defined by the one unique, in the, people can't do it. It's completely random, their choice is completely random. Okay, and uh, um, nevertheless, uh, it is as if, you know, I'm saying your action, your gaze, you know, your, your motion, <laughs> your motor control can see it, as if it has a different color to it, you know, you get attracted to it. And, but your higher brain area is as, as if color blind. Okay. And so this just sounds impossible, but this is the prediction from a theory that V1 creates a bottom-up saliency map to attract your gaze attention, which select the area to decode. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, for instance, here there's is no barrier. Yeah, uh, that's the possible thing you could. But nevertheless, from our behavior issues, that we do not decode it, right? Well, we know that when it gets to perception, it's not there. But that's yeah. what we mean. The behavior shows that you can't do it. But, but that doesn't mean it's not in the Doesn't, not, doesn't mean you're right. You're right. It could be. But the thing, this is just uh, like a, uh, you know, it's not 100% proof, uh, proof, but it's just at least behaviorally you can't do it. Okay. And... Uh, so uh, that sounds impossible, but it's, cre it's a prediction from a the theory. So the theory is impossible. So if you have a theorist behind a the theory, you may abandon the theory because it's just wrong. Or you may persist if you have a good reason. So let me tell you the good reason. 
The theory does not predict it will scale awareness. The theory predicts that it will attract your attention. Yes, but, but what's impossible is that why does it attract our awareness? <laughs> that, 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 I don't know. Well, I mean, it's, it's impossible from our common sense part of view, you know, because we think whatever attracts your attention is Maybe something distinct. That's right, you're right. So that, I was, I, that's why I like you ask questions. <laughs> that's right. So. Uh, so visual input comes in. Usually in behavior, you measure saliency, uh, attract attention by vision, measuring reaction time to find a particular spot. If it's quick, then you say this spot is salient. And, uh, and, and this is salient behaviorally. People think there's a saliency map. A lot of people study saliency map. They're used to guide your attention, you know, as if it's a phenomenological kind of thing. And, uh, um, but then the theory says the saliency map is just a V1's firing rate. This is the dumbest possible theory you can think of. Uh, really, uh, and then you say, oh, okay, then this is sent to V2 in a higher area, and that's for decoding, but only after you select uh, what's to decode, and you select through superior characters. Turns out that the major input to superior characters is V1, huge bundles of anatomical connection go to it. And so this is as if, you know, let's say this vertical bar excites, you know, 20 spy per second, and horizontal bar the one spy per second, and, uh, uh, and superiors doesn't care that this vertical bar gives 20 spike or one, it just looks at the currency, the, the, the firing rate is the universal currency bidding for saliency. And uh, uh, you, it could be, you know, uh, spiked by a red bar rather than uh, by a red feet, a tuned feet cell rather than a vertical tuned cell. It doesn't matter. It's like I'm going to ice cream shop. All it cares is my dollars. You know, it doesn't care that I'm a woman, I'm Chinese. You know, somebody else gives dollars, they also sell you. you know, the, the, the shopkeeper only cares about the dollars I give and doesn't care my feature tuning. And so how does V1 do it? I'll say it later. But this is the traditional theory. The traditional theory sounds very intuitive and natural. So this is like a, uh, this is a psychological point of view of lots of people. So visual stimuli come in and separate into different features, you know, red feature map, green feature map, and all these different feature map maybe in different brain areas are not quite clear. And uh, since, you know, you can attract, saliency is the degree of attentional attraction to it, bottom attraction, okay. And so since you can be attracted, salient because it's red color or because it's vertical orientation or because it's motion. So it's uh, regardless of feature, that's why they uh, think they should sum it up and then it's a master salient map to guide attention. And uh, this is a particular framework and nevertheless this framework has been, have been around for so long in textbooks and so on. It's been guiding uh, because it implies it can't be in V1. Because by the time the, the master map is summing everything up, all the units in there cannot be tuned to any features because they should respond to all features. And therefore, cannot be in V1. Maybe in high areas when cells are not tuned to features, so FEF, LP, and so on. And that means a lot of the search for CDS in map has been always in higher visual areas. Nobody uh, looked in V1 before. Um, but nevertheless, it's this way of thinking, although it's natural, kind of blocking our way of thinking, we can we can unblock ourselves with a cartoon where, uh, where you, let's say you have an auction shop as an auctioneer, maybe it's superior curriculus, it's blind to features, but auction shop has a, has a slogan that says, attention auction here, no discrimination between your feature preferences, only spikes count. And so you have all these viewer cells coming to bid for attention. Now here's one viewer cell turn to color, bid three spikes, and this viewer cell uh, turn to motion, bid one spike, and so on. And he wins. And, you know, even though Superior Critics himself doesn't actually pay attention, but it's the auctioneer, you know. Uh, even though he is uh, attention uh, uh, feature blind, whatever the attention given uh, to this guy is not feature blind, okay? It's the selection is feature blind, but uh, whatever it, uh, attention is not feature blind. But all we care, the theory is about selection, not post-selectional attentional process which the word attention sometimes means selection, sometimes means post-selectional processing. I'm talking about selection only. So, um, and also that means attention doesn't have a price, fixed price. It's the highest bid. So highest bid here is three pounds or three dollars or three shekels. And, uh, but nevertheless, in another scene, you know, three pound is not so high bid. It could be a hundred pounds. It depends on who else is bidding. And therefore, you cannot just stick one single electrode in the brain and try to say, okay, is this high saliency, low saliency? You have to stick 100 million electrodes in the V1 and try to measure all of them and see who is the highest. So this really is very difficult to test the theory, um, but we're trying to go around it. And uh, so, 
uh, how does V1 do it? You have all these V1 neurons and, uh, and you have these you know, attention, uh, uh, orientation maps, you have, uh, there's a parameter cell, this is a stolen from Basking, uh, parameter cell, you can, it's in the horizontal, uh, vertical tuned uh, column and spread its axons, collateral axons to other vertical tuned column, preferably. And, uh, but if you make all surrounding, you know, this is the firing, but if you have surrounding bars all vertical, the firing goes like this, nothing is salient. Okay, and uh, you know, suddenly 20 spike become one spike, or not, not such exaggeration. It's more like 20 spike become five spike. Everybody become five spikes. Okay, and but this is the Huber weasel picture. Okay, this is a Huber weasel one 20 spike, and so basically neurons tune to the same orientation, iso orientation suppress, they suppress each other. Therefore, once they suppress each other, they all get low. Nobody suppresses. It. This is the most salient. That is also the most salient because the, the suppression is orientation respects mutual orientation. So all these horizontal bars suppress each other, but this vertical bar is the only one that escapes suppression, so uh, that's more or less uh, it. So and, uh, so, but, but yeah. in terms of spike count, I'm yeah. confused, uh, all of them fire, fire the same amount, right? All of them fire by the same amount. They're all five spikes, and this is 20 spikes. So yeah. yeah, but, but, but you imply that it's spike count. It's the spike count that's the currency to bid for attention in superior clickers. Superclus so has a retinotopic map, so it has the spatial map. All it needs is spatial map to do the selection. It doesn't need to know. This is because that's the only neuron that doesn't get suppressed by other neurons, which is also tuned to vertical to suppress it. Because other neurons are tuned to horizontal, the iso orange suppression, so only the same orange suppress each other. Yeah. In the cartoon, the in the cartoon, it's mostly the bidders. You know, these bidders. So they should be beating each other. No, this is like after they suppress each other, now they're the final money <laughs> a, a, a spike count to, to code to bid. Okay, so they first of all, uh, you can imagine the superior crisis like the firefighter going looks through the forest, you know, helicopter looking all the forest fires, and whoever, you know, whether it's oak tree or pine tree, doesn't matter, the biggest fire I go shoot my, you know, spray onto it, yes. And it will come as a consequence. Yeah, okay. And so that's the idea. It's, so Huber Weasel basically look at this and, and uh, um, you know, so for instance, another, another thing is, let's say this thing does pop out, but it's the, uh, it's the vertical cell that's uh, signaling a higher spike count. But you can also have a blue color tune cell responding to it. But the blue color tune cell, because on this spot there's lots of rest of the field overlapping, right? It could be blue color tune cells will not be signaling at all because it's suppressed by other blue color tuned cells responding to the surround. So the highest bidder is actually vertical cell. So basically, it's the maximum response at each location. Even though each location may have 1,000 cells, you know, some tune to horizontal, vertical, red color, blue color, whatever, it's the highest bid because superior is kind of stupid. What I mean is we have to think in this. Not only stupid, it's also fast. Competition fast, just the highest bidder rather than some order or the, or the bidder together. Uh, so yeah. you're saying that superior collectivist knows where the salience is but not what it is? That's right. So basically, you need to, another thing is, remember, you need to select before decoding. But by the time you already know what it is, you already decoded, why bother selecting? You, see, I mean, you select and then decode. And so here, nothing pops out, right? And therefore, you will not have any V1 cells firing very high. In fact, even though you have a unique feature, unique red and vertical combination here, uh, the reason is the red cell is suppressed by other red cells in the surround. Vertical cell is suppressed by other vertical cells in the surround. So nobody is bidding for this unique combination. And indeed, behaviorally, it doesn't pop up. And that's like that. And so now let's look at physiologically. Huber weasel picture, you have a cell tuned to vertical orientation. That's wonderful, spiking happily. That's the rest of the field outlined in dots. But nonetheless, since 1970s, we have known that this Huber weasel picture is not that correct. Uh, because if you put other bars outside of the field by themselves, they don't evoke any responses, but they suppress the response with, to the stimulus within the field by a lot, in more than half, a lot. Okay. So 20 spikes become 5 spikes. But if you make the outside bars randomly oriented rather than the same thing, uh, they're still suppressed, but not as much. Uh, as, you know, only suppressed like 50%. But if you make the outside bars you know, orthogonally oriented, then you almost don't suppress. So you can see... Isn't this a monotonic relationship with saliency? Highest bidder, highest bidder, mediocre bidder, maybe highest, who knows, maybe you know, also mediocre bidder. This is the highest bidder. Within, within that 
scene. Okay, this is one scene, this is one scene, this is one scene, yeah? So, and then you can also, but nevertheless, it's the same residue field. You have electrodes sticking there, same residue field. If you have a low contrast bar in it, if you have the outside bars lined up like that, you can have excitation. It's, so it's not just suppression. You can have excitation like 300%. And so you can have suppression 80%, 300%. So it's a factor of like 10 across. It's a huge selective amplification of a factor of 10. And so that's really... Um, uh, but so for our intuitive uh, reasoning, I'm going to use this in my talk, because that's the dominant suppression is most relevant. And uh, so if we have this theory, you know, it's still very, uh, you know, sound very into, uh, speculative, but we need to test it. So to test it, say, okay, can B1 output explain visual behavior in visual search? So we already know this is salient, this is not salient, it looks like intuitively it might explain, right? But we have lots of other things, you know, this you see a salient cross among bars. But here, what is salient? You don't really see it, right? But actually, that's the opposite of that. Cross become bars, bar become cross, right? So all these are behavioral data. You can do psychophysics here. You immediately see, can V1 explain it? And you can see that here is a uh, uh, you know, very salient thing come out. But if you make the background bars uh, randomly positioned, it doesn't look as salient. So all these... Fortunately, data are in the literature, so we don't have to repeat the experiment. But now we need to measure V1 cells. Remember, you have to stick 100 million neuron, a single unit electron. It's a very difficult experiment. So we can wait for technology to happen for a few years, maybe, hopefully. But, but if you don't want to wait, I'm going to do something which is quite much more inferior. But that's as good as we can get. We're trying to build a software V1. But then, um, you know, then we try to kind of uh, imitate. This is not very good, but this, uh, this is a, a middle line. And that's actually one reason why, I say, you know, as a theorist, you either abandon the theory or you persist like a good reason. And this is my good reason, because you build a model, then you find uh, something to encourage you. So the model is uh, actually 10 years old, but because uh, 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 of this critical reason, uh, I, I need to explain a bit more. Um, so it's a, like a layer 2 V1 with lots of parameter cell I mark it as plus means they're excitatory cells and inhibitor interneuron I mark it minus means they're inhibitor interneurons and uh, you know they're EI connected right and uh, you know um, they get direct visual input so for instance this cell might be receiving input from this vertical bar this cell may be receiving input from this horizontal bar and so on and then they can have mutual excitations between them or they can have dysmetic inhibitions between them and so therefore, let's say the input to these three cells may be having, you know, strength one, 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 and output can be, like, say, two, two, and half, depending on their interactions. So this effectively is transforming a contrast input to saliency output. And so what you have is these kind of inputs, you will have, uh, you know, even though all the other cell bars are same contrast, you will have higher responses near the borders, higher responses for this pop out location, and higher responses from the for these uh, uh, bars uh, on, the, on the complex edges. That's right, I'm going to show you the connectivity. Uh, uh, from yesterday's talk, everybody, well, basically, uh, I'm first of all looking at conceptual framework. So basically, this is highlighting the important image locations where translation invariants in inputs break down. So these are more or less like if you talk about conditional probability of spheres at this location, conditional spheres on surround, this is the least predictable location. So that's where. Uh, that's the statistical language about it. And uh, so these are, you know, uh, deviate from predictions from the context. And uh, so schematically, if you have an original image, let's say only has three bars, and your V1 has, let's say, three by four hypercolumns, and each hypercolumn lots of orientation to the cells. And, uh, you know, it only excites three cells in these three particular hypercolumns, and the rest of the cells are not excited. So this is the Huber weasel picture, right? Feed forward, going to V1, ice cube model. And then the next bit is between these hypercolumns, different hypercolumns and different cells uh, within and between. Uh, you have intracortical interaction, so recurrent network within it. And then the output is not the same as the input contrast. And so the critical bit is from this end there, what is the connection pattern? So the connection pattern is a little bit like that. They are not all to all, they are finite range, but the uh, terminology is long range connection, means they're longer than the rest of the few sizes. And uh, so, for instance, here is a zooming up, and you see uh, that this is a cell tuned to horizontal orientations, and it's connected to other cells 
turn to near horizontal orientation is kind of co-aligned with it uh, in an excitatory manner, so it can have collinear facilitations. And it's in disynaptic inhibited uh, by other uh, near horizontal orientations this way. And, uh, and so I, I just to compare a lot of models in the literature, in the literature, lots of people study, uh, in fact, the next two talks will before we on it as well. Uh, uh, it, uh, cortical circuits usually within the hypercolon. So within the hypercolon, I'm not even drawing it because otherwise it messes up my picture. So you have interactions within the hypercolon. You know, you have orientation to like a burning shine. That's 15 years ago when I heard your talk for the first time, marginal state and so on. So the interaction within the hypercolon, okay. And now within hypercolon, we have interaction and also between us. So the space and orientation connected network. So this, yeah. This would Yeah. In uh, fact, the, the in fact, you, you uh, what you want is these suppression are stronger than these excitations. But in fact, all these excitations they are they are EI networks. So you have J J J E E connections as well as J I E connections. So it's a net facilitation. It's also contrast dependent. I'm just simplifying it down. And uh, so so it's designed such that because after all, we want to have an imitation V1. We want this model to imi v, imitate V1. Otherwise, we cannot believe this model's behavior. Okay. So it's designed such that it imitates V1. So this is, the, this is the rate model thing you can see in the X. You know, so I is the location, spatial location. Theta is the preferred orientation. And so this X is the parameter cell. And the Y is the inhibitor interneuron. This is uh, more or less because X, Y, E, I pair is a, is a harmonic oscillator. You know, harmonic is you have a um, position and momentum. It's orthogonal to each other, right? So X, Y. <laughs> Like that, and you have these uh, within hypercolumn interactions, uh, which, which I did not even include because otherwise, crust, uh, cr uh, you know, really cut up my uh, picture. So for each location i and theta, you have a direct input into it, and then uh, you have, you know, x and y going to that. And uh, so the critical thing, as we already heard from yesterday's talk, are these recurrent connections to make this network work, and these recurrent network connections just to be contrasting through yes they are not random completely not uh, not random at all and uh, uh, so how to design these we kind of these are uh, in these papers trying to explain how these are, are designed uh, but I'll, I will not dig into the details even though you can imagine these are kind of you know long range excitatory connections and inhibit uh, uh, found, found a parameter cell to to um, inhibit to interneurons so, uh, so how do we design it? We want to make it uh, satisfy these constraints. So this is like a boundary problem. You, you have input, if you like this, you want the output to be highlighting the borders. So that's more for segmentation. So this is like a mean field uh, requirement, mean field solution requirement for your uh, you know, constraints. So the work should be your JIJ and the WIJ such that when the mean field solution comes, uh, you know, it will be like that. The another thing is, if your input is like that, you have a collinear aligned bars and there's a noise bar. You want the collinear aligned bars uh, you are more highly activated. So you can imagine these units are facilitating each other, net facilitation. Yeah. And the, to have this highlighted, you imagine these units are inhibiting each other. Therefore, the border is less inhibited, so it's relatively highlighted. So you have facilitation and inhibition, and uh, which will naturally make this more likely to happen. That's the marginal states in space, not in orientation. So you have non, uh, you know, uniform inputs, but it will do spontaneous pattern formation, non-uniform outputs. The reason is all these bars are facilitating each other along here, but inhibiting each other across there. You will have winner take all and do that. And that's uh, uh, so in order for this not to happen, you have to reduce the facilitation and inhibition. If you reduce it so much, it will not fit physiology. So it turns out this is a mathematical problem we should solve. This is uh, um, also previous work with Peter Dayan and later explaining this. Um, uh, this is the selective amplification we talked about in 1999. You want to selectively amplify some pattern without hallucination. And it turns out this requires EI network and not the Hoffman like network, which is actually one of the reasons perhaps uh, why uh, Steve Grossberg's work network never works because it's a Hoffman like network. They say it's EI network. And, um, and also, basically, again, it says no hallucination, but selectively amplify some and not other patterns. So, so that yeah. just, in terms of the data, uh, I mean, in, in many, many people's hands, uh -huh. um, a vert, you know, if you have a vertical, a vertical, small vertical uh, divorce patch, uh -huh. and you put a vertical divorce patch vertical to it, it uh -huh. suppresses response, yeah. not enhanced response. That's right. Um, 
in the high contrast, yeah. yeah. In low contrast, it does. Yeah. So in the early version, in fact, because of that, my early version of the model was uh, not very uh, good in this respect. So in fact, this model is quantitatively quite different from V1. But nevertheless, I kind of kept it for 10 years. I never changed these model parameters in order to be consistent across my papers. So I kind of resisted updating the model parameters. Uh, so this is a very lousy V1, <laughs> monkey V1. It's poor. It never kind of evolved afterwards. But nevertheless, it, it enables other people in the, uh, because I publish all these model parameters, and I know undergrads have uh, reproduced them without asking me. That means it's clear enough everybody can reproduce. That's the purpose. Uh, even though it's not perfect, I kept it this way. And uh, so then you kind of calibrate this model by making sure this model reproduces the human weasel pictures as well as these nuisance pictures for human weasel, uh, everything. And that's kind of calibrating your instrument, yeah? And once you have done that, model parameters fixed. So this V1 doesn't have any plasticity or evolution or perceptual learning, nothing. And then, um, then you go uh, put this V1 to the to the recitative uh, uh, stimulus, and then you see what the response is. And you, I use these, uh, you can see the response to this horizontal bar is the highest. And, um, and if you look at, uh, that's the perspective from the superior calicus, it sees all its firing rate. Uh, in fact, at this spot, is the, the superior calicus just see the maximum firing rate from the horizontal bar, not the vertical bar. So the superior calicus didn't see across. See if you can just see here is a high firing rate and ignore the low firing rate. So with the maximum firing rate at this location. So that's what superior crisis sees. And uh, you can of course yes. Yeah, I just want to make a comment huh? about the symmetry break. I mean it seems to me the symmetry break is a good prediction in that we do make surprises to individual lines in the symmetry case. And the symmetry break is a good prediction we do make a car. Yeah, we do do some. That's true. So in a sense that I'm not sure whether it's the result of symmetry breaking or not. Um, it could be top down, I don't know. But it maybe does symmetry breaking, yeah. The another thing is we actually have hallucinations. You can take drugs and uh, then you knock on V1. <laughs> this is yeah, what... You're not arguing that we perceive. We don't perceive the cross as brighter. Uh-huh. That's right. We, we make a saccade We make saccade to it. That's right. Yes, right. So in fact, uh, decoding, you have to kind of uh, correct the saliency distortion because otherwise you will see it brighter. That's another issue. Yeah. And so, and, uh, and then you know, if you do the histogram of these firing rate, you'll see most people here and there's one outlier. That's your, you can do the z-score on it to say it is high z-score house. And the z-score, of course, V1 doesn't calculate z-score. And I calculate z-score just to compare with uh, uh, behavioral data more easily. So now you can see this Z is very high, you know, then obviously it pops out. And indeed it pops out. Right? And this, there's something unique, it doesn't pop out. What is it? Do you see it? It has a target horizontal bar and 45 degree bar. It's, it's, it's right in the middle, <laughs> right here. So this is a unique conjunction of horizontal and 45 degree. Everybody else is vertical and 45 degree or horizontal and minus 45 degree. So this conjunction doesn't pop out. It's because in V1, you have the horizontal bar suppressed by other horizontal bar, 45 degree by other 40. So the z-score is very low. And uh, uh, here again, why is this vertical bar doesn't pop out? Because it's suppressed by other vertical bars, so it doesn't pop out. Yeah, OK. And then why does this, uh, you know, as high as anything than that high uh, than that? This is because, let's say, this neuron evokes six spikes per second, but everybody else evokes five spikes per second. So you are still the highest bidder, so you are very salient. But here you have six spikes per second, even the average five spikes per second goes from other people, some ten spikes per second, some three spikes per second. So you are not the highest bidder, so your z-score is very low, so you don't pop up. So uh, these qualitatively show why it is, this is the collinear facilitation somebody asked about, so they come out as a consequence, and the uh, complex textures. But these seem to be all very intuitive, very correct, right? You know, you, I don't even need to show the quantitative stuff. So uh, and then the more, the real confidence boosting, I say you persist by this impossible model is this, where things are more subtle. You, you compare, uh, uh, you know, when you do visual search for a circle among circles with a gap with the other way around. So search for a circle with a gap among circles. And uh, you see which one is easier. Now, by the way, V1s don't respond to a circle or a circle with a back gap. V1 just respond to a bar here, a bar here, a bar here, a bar here. Okay, so V1 doesn't have these circles with the gaps tuned cells. And so 
You say, which one is easier? They're a bit more subtle, yeah, the, this one is easier. So what you do is in the V1 model, you take the responses from these, and you find the highest response and calculate the z-score. Send it here, you find the highest response to target and calculate the z-score, see which z-score is bigger. And you see whether it's the same direction. And you see the V1 model does horribly uh, wrong quantitatively, but qualitatively is correct, yeah. So that's why this V1 is quantitatively very poor, but I just can't kept it, you know. And the, because I don't want to tune any parameters, zero parameter, that's it. You know, I already published them, I don't want to tune them. So which, which yeah. uh, in, in the bottom uh, uh, pattern yeah. uh, fires, at, at which location do you have a high fire rate? So uh, obviously the C score, so, so the highest fire rate probably is within this uh, target. That's anywhere, why. Anywhere along. Anywhere along. So I just take that, so on the target there's one, two, three, four, five bars. So within these five V1 neurons, I pick the highest one and calculate this one, yes. So all these four bars by I'm not sure which one. This is why it's very subtle. It's both ice orange suppression and collinear facilitation. It's a combination of them. That's why because it's subtle, when you get the direction right, you feel like, mm, good, you know, because it's not so obvious. In comparison to these previous examples, right, it's, it's obvious. I don't even have to simulate it. I can obviously the see this. Uh, right? huh? But in the model, you can tell us, right? Yeah, I forgot. It's 10 years ago. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and so, uh, oh, what happened? What is this black line? Okay. So, <laughs> and then this is right. And this, you want to search for a pair of uh, uh, divergent bars among pair of parallel bars. And that's pair of parallel bars among divergent bars. And which one is easier? Bottom, slightly easier, yeah? So this is even subtler, uh, really. And V1 gets it right too, subtler. And the uh, next one, and uh, I search for a longer bar among shorter bars, or shorter bar among longer bar, that's obvious. You don't have to, because we have collinear facilitation, so we get it. And this one is search for a, a straight among curved or curved among straight. This is easier, and you get it. And, and this is searching for uh, uh, a circle among ellipse or ellipse among circles, slightly easier than one, and you get it. And this is when things are subtle, and you, you know, you, anytime you could get it wrong here or wrong here, maybe not quite wrong here. But, and so when things are subtle, you don't, and it's not just isolated dispersion, nor it's just collinear facility, it's a combination of these subtle things. And when it gets it all right without any parameters, you wonder maybe this is too good to be accidental. And uh, therefore, it's a good reason to pursue this, pursue this seemingly impossible uh, uh, serialization map. And so now let's pursue it. Now let's derive this impossible prediction. And remember that this is, uh, you know, this pops out because it's the only one not being suppressed, and because the surround is different from it. So can we make the surround different from it, just by putting in different eyes? Yeah, and that means if the surround suppression is stronger when it comes from the same eye or then when it comes different eye, then you should have it. And that's indeed the case. Um, the angulus, even though they only look at 12 cells, they seem to show that. And that means, you know, when you fuse, you see that there should be a higher response there, and that's a prediction. And uh, so you predict eye of origin singleton, even though indistinct to awareness, it should attract your attention. And so to test it, we, we let people do this experiment where they, they cannot report to us, so we don't let them report, we let them do something else. Search for a uniquely oriented bar. You need to tell us as soon as possible whether it's in the left or right half of the visual field. And, uh, but without letting them know, I, I put all bars in the left eye, nothing in the right eye. That's the baseline situation. Of course, they're uncomfortable with that. So you put binocular dots to anchor their uh, uh, virgins. But I'm not sure them just for clarity. And uh, they have to tell you, and they usually take them 0 0.6 seconds to tell you where it is. Okay, they press the button and say left or right. But if then, you put this target bar in the other eye, they still see like that. They cannot tell the difference between this and that, right? And suddenly, their response is 100 milliseconds faster. And this is because to V1, it appears like that, even though to our perception, it appears like that. V1 sees this distinctively, and it helps it. And but if you do the other way around, you put one of the background bars in the other side, uh, in the other eye, and suddenly, it's 200 milliseconds slower than the baseline. Yeah? This is because to V1, it appears like this. You know, this is very distracting. It, even though I'm not asking him to do that, you know, they still see this. They're supposed to look at that bar. <laughs> okay, that's not target. And so 200 milliseconds is 
a time for a saccard. You know, they just saccard to the wrong location. And this was in, uh, originally just reaction time data. Recently, I checked eyes to find that's indeed the case. The gaze, 75% of the time, go there first round and go there, just like that. And uh, um, this is uh, 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 um, an overt gaze attraction. But you can also see covertly, a covert, covert, covert gaze killing. You, you let them do this task where it's only shown by 200 milliseconds and mass. 200 milliseconds is not enough time for them to move their gaze, but enough to move your covert attention. So the task is to find an only non-horizontal bar anywhere within the array and tell whether it's left tilted or right tilted. And uh, this is purposely made difficult such that, you know, because it's actually 20 degree away from it, and it's, uh, so it's very difficult to do. Uh, how difficult it is? is like this. If it's in the baseline situation, uh, you know, everything is in one, one, one eye, it's difficult enough. And then if it's uh, that way, it should be easier. And if one of the, you know, uh, like that, yeah. It will be easier in this situation and more difficult there. And indeed, you find that they make more errors when it's not guided. But when it's properly guided by V1, they make less errors. And when it's, again, invalidly guided, they make more errors. And this is the so significant. And, uh, and if you make them say, do they know? They, they have no idea. These are all interleaved trials. And you, you explicitly test them and say, what if none of them is oriented? You just show them you know, either something, nothing is in the other eye, or there's something in the other eye. They're all horizontal bars. And you just, they just have to say yes or no. They don't have to tell you which one. Just say, is there something in the other eye, yes or no? And they give it a, a chance level I'll guess. Yeah. This is in a different uh, session. They first of all finish this session showing a queuing effect, yeah? Strong queuing effect. Then I ask them to take a break. And then I tell them, did you notice there's something in the different eyes? They say, oh, I didn't notice. Now they I tell you now it is something in the different eye. Now you need to tell me uh, yes or no, is there something in the different eye? It's the same subject. One of them is me, and I actually do much better than they, they do. But still, I get chance level. Um, um, but four of the na naive subject, one of them is me. Um, so this shows that attentional attraction, which is the action, the movement of the eye, is dissociable from awareness, which makes sense because decoding is after you select. You, of course, select without decoding first. And uh, um, this is like aware versus wanting vision and action versus perception. And, and uh, you may think this is maybe uh, away from uh, everyday life, but every day you have foreground, background, and on the boundary there is a monocular region which can attract your uh, gaze and which can uh, uh, do fast figure one segmentation. And uh, uh, I just, I don't know whether I have time for a very quick one. Uh, okay, I think we have to break very soon. Okay, <laughs> very quick one. So this is just to show that, uh, uh, I'm not going to talk about third, I'm going to do this. This is just to contrast with the traditional framework. The, uh, so the V1 framework is the highest bidder. That's a very uh, you know, simple but fast com computation, highest bidder. But traditional framework is not is, is a summation of all the f uh, feature maps added together. Therefore, at each feature, uh, at each spatial location, the, the, the response is the summation of feature at all, in all feature maps. And so you say, is it really a maximum or sum? Do you max over all features or just sum? Okay, V1 says max and it uh, says sum. So here's a, a, a you know, a segmentation task where all the bars evoke higher responses than the surrounding bars. Let's say this is 10 spikes per second, these 5 spikes per second, let's say. And that's why the CDNC Mac uh, are higher. But if you have a checkable pattern, each one of the bars also on, suppressed only by half a neighbor, not the other half, just like these border bars. So they will also have 10 spikes per second for everybody. So these are all 10 spikes per second. Nobody is salient. Everybody is highest bidder or lowest bidder. And this is, you know, pop out. Nothing pops out here. But if you superpose this with that, you get that kind of texture. This kind of texture, if you use Anderson Burden, uh, Bergen or, or, or Landy's, uh, easily segmented, but not by V1. Uh, even though all these orientations 45 degrees away is much, you know, more beyond the uh, JND. But nevertheless, you have 10 spikes per second from these neurons and 10 spikes per second from these neurons. So at the border, if you add it together, it will be 20 spikes per second. But away from the border, you have 10 spikes per second from these neurons, 5 spikes per second from these neurons. You only have 15 spikes per second. So you can still pop out if you add them together. 
But if you only take the maximum firing at each location, which is super clear, just take maximum, it sees all the higher speed on every location, so it doesn't know, so it should not pop up. So V1 theory predicts that this should be difficult to segment, but traditional theory says it should be just as easy as that, almost. But you can see that this is done with my postdoc case May. It's very easy to segment here, not so easy. And the, uh, the difference is more than 100 milliseconds, uh, hundreds of milliseconds apart. So this is, uh, shows, uh, so anyway, I'm going to skip at all, all this next one. So uh, in summary, we have a functional rule of V1, understanding V1 not by predicting the cell firing, but from cell firing to behavior. And this may be impossible, but only from the uh, uh, conventional perspective. But in fact, more conventional is actually, the, 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 you can just copy from nature, you have this you know, retina to detect them, you know, the frog. So if we copy from frog, we can arrive from, um, to this V1 <coughs> theory much easier than if we think too smart, uh, like a higher level cognition. And then to arrive to that, you need a dynamical ne a neural circuit to, to, to do this, you know, to help develop enough confidence about this, uh, um, you know, big departure from traditional ideas and its non-trivial prediction. And have implications on other things which I, I will not talk. Thank you very much. That's nice about this field. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, so one of them, of course, is that uh, we find that the things that high level is faces can pop out. Mm -hmm. and that's where we think they pop out at high level. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is things that uh, Ken has been great bringing up of mm -hmm. details of V1, where, for example, even the lateral inhibition in V1, I think it's on a spatial scale, which is smaller than uh, pop out uh, is occurring. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if you can find the slide with the conjunction search yeah. very early in your uh, presentation. Oh, all the way back. Before. Yeah. Uh, if you have the question, actually, it's my last experiment about conjunction search. Just something search. with a, a, a conjunction search. Yeah. Uh, just to say that uh -huh. uh, one of the things that we did with the uh -huh. uh, binocular uh, presentation, uh -huh. if you do a standard conjunction search where you have two different kinds of distractors, uh -huh. the target which has to combine the two features, yeah. if you put in one eye the uh, one kind of distractor, and in the other eye the other kind of distractor, and uh -huh. the target, of course, only one eye, then it becomes a pop-out. Uh -huh. uh, because it monocularly is a pop-out, even though, so subject C is the same as a standard conjunction, and yet they're able to do it much faster. Yes. Which I would interpret to be higher level, but it would be interesting to try. Yes, to this is actually level. my third experiment, trying to uh, address this conjunction issue. And turns out it's a V1 prediction, or, uh, uh, you know, in various ways. Although it's a conjunction by double conjunction rather than the other way around. And another thing addressing is a local range connection with a global pop-up. This is very uh, familiar in solid state physics. For instance, you have a local range molecular, interac molecular interaction, but global range crystal structures. So you can have local range interaction global. It's microscopic. So V1 is, in a sense, of doing from microscopic resistive fields, microscopic interaction range, but macroscopic behavior because of this non-trivial uh, neural circuit behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so suppose V1 is, is Windotex or uh, circuit, which can be used in many kinds of visual combination. Does it demonstrate Is it still clear? Say it again. If you need 100 times more machinery, you can do that. Is it still clear? Say it again. If you need 100 times more machinery, you can basically. Yeah, uh, this is something I haven't proven, but I, I was uh, listening to one of our ECVP stuff is that you want pop up very quickly. Remember, I only want to do max. I don't even want to sum. I don't want to decode to decide where to look, OK? You have to be quick. And so therefore, we will overcomplete redundant. You don't want to say, OK, if this orientation is pop up, that orientation. Let's say you only have two orientations. That's enough. One time complete, OK? But what if it's a, you know, oblique bar you want to pop up? Then you have to infer the oblique bar from these two orthogonal bars. And say, oh, this computation takes step. And then all these contextual interaction design may be more difficult. That I haven't proved. But, uh, Qualitatively, think it will be more difficult. Yes. Uh, 
I, I think this could uh, open, uh, you know, we can try, uh, you know, the, uh, for me it's kind of as, uh, much uh, easier to just copy nature. So I haven't proved why it has to be, but intuitively this is the reason. Yeah. Okay.